I was just going to move these. Oh. But I can help you. Hey. <laughs> help me? Grab an oar. Well, good morning, Word of Life Christian Center. 1804 7th Avenue, Rock Island, Illinois. Man. Uh, I'm here because I was born in the house. Uh, I was, yeah, pretty much. I was a good Catholic kid. Uh, went to church. Got to be about 18 years old and realized that the questions that I had couldn't be answered by the people that were in my life. Um, and so I just kind of meandered myself away from the Catholic Church, like a lot of us do. And uh, met some great people who invited me to go to church here. Uh, I was, you know, 20 years old, 21 years old, and they were all married, had kids, and they're like, you know, we're looking for a new church too. Let's, let's look around. And I'm like, really? There's other churches than just the Catholic Church? You know, I've driven by them, but I've never... So I... Uh, came. Uh, they loved it. I loved them. Their kids loved it here. So I'm like, well, I, I'd, I'd love to hang out with you guys. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to church here too. So we used to have theater seats. It used to be hardwood floors because it was basketball back there. And we used to have theater seats. And my spot was up the middle aisle, about five rows back on the right side there. I sat in about the second or third seat. And I sat here for seven years, learned a ton. The foundation of my Christian faith is all because of Word of Life Christian Center um, and the people that were involved in this place. So it has a very sweet, sweet place in my heart. I currently live in Columbus, Ohio. My wife, Kama, and I, we have five kids. Two of them are college age, 23 and 20, two girls. And then we have Two boys that'll be graduating seniors this year from high school. And then we have a 13-year-old. S- something like that. So <laughs> I hope he's not listening. What's up, Brogan? Good to see you this morning. Um, I just love this place. I love the people. I love the spirit of this place. I love what God is doing here. I love your pastor. I, t- I tell you what. Just the gentleness you know, me and Camel were talking about it, you know, yesterday, or this morning, I think. Just the gentleness, the sweetness, the genuineness. You know, I was uh, talking to Robert back there this morning, and he's like, it's just, it's like he's so believable. He's so lovable. He's so, and you know, if you're going to come to church somewhere, you don't want a pastor that you look at every Sunday and go, eh, you know, is, is he living the way that he's talking? And and I can assure you that Tanner is living what he's speaking or attempting to live what he speaks. So very genuine. So um, <clears throat> he told me that I could have 35 minutes this morning. Now, I did see last Sunday he took 38 and a half. <laughs> so, but I figure since the Bears aren't working today or, to, or playing today, we'd go till like 1230 or 1 o'clock. So... <laughs> The old days. Yes, you're right. The old days. Yeah, that's true. Um, hmm. I, just, I just think this place is a real gem. You know, it's funny because I was thinking about the other day and I was writing stuff down. You know, I did my whole thing and then I set my sermon down and like every day I'd be like, ooh, ooh, you know, and then I'd go back to it and rewrite, you know. And I was said, I just felt in my spirit, I said, this place is just a hidden gem in the Quad Cities, you know. And I could hear God say, not anymore. And I was like, what? So anyway, I, that's, what, that's how God speaks to me. He just, he kind of nudges me like, you know, ah, you think it's hidden now. It's not going to be hidden much longer. So especially with you people, this worship, the leadership team, Tanner, Amy, man, why would you not want to come to church here? So anyway, so Cam and I's pastor back home says, note takers are history makers. So if you've got a pen and a pencil and a Bible, let's get it out and get started. So turn to Mark chapter 6. 
<laughs> and if you don't enjoy the service, Tanner will be back next Sunday and <laughs> everything will be back to normal. <laughs> Although I do would like to be invited back, so maybe I should control myself a little bit. Mark chapter 6, verse 45. Now right before this, Jesus feeds the 5,000. 5,000 men, which means, you know, if half of them were married, 7,500 people with wives, if they had kids, 10, 12,000 people with, you know, two fish and five loaves of bread. Just an incredible miracle. Just, and the disciples were there. And how, you know, what, I thought about that this morning. You know, it's not like they were frying fish, little batter and stuff, and then breaking it apart. They were taking the fish and and then here's a piece of flesh off of it. And, and all of a sudden, the disciples would look back in their bag and that same fish would be there again. It's it, it just like, it, and it just went on and on and on and on. Just a mighty miracle. And I can imagine what they felt like. I mean, can you imagine being a part of that sort of a, a miracle? I mean, it just must have impacted their lives. I mean, I mean, if it would have been me, I would have had my cell phone out and you know, taking selfies with the, the people and Instagram, you should have been here, you know, look at what happened, look what God did. But that isn't how God works. God doesn't like you to bask too long in something amazing or something terrible. He'd only had three and a half years to teach those disciples. He knew that he had to get everything in them in three and a half years to advance the kingdom of God on this earth. So he wasn't about lingering. He wasn't about high fives and wow, wasn't that great? And you know, this was awesome. And he was not about that. Because what happens in verse 45 is the first word is immediately. Immediately, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. So I'm going to focus on, well, we don't have the verse. That's right. I forgot. Don't, don't worry about it. The other side, right? The other side is important, right? It speaks of destination. If you don't have a destination in mind, you know, I drove from Columbus, Ohio yesterday. And, I, you know, I've been here 800 times, you know, in the 20 years that I've lived in Columbus. I've been back here. So I know where I'm going. But if you don't know exactly where you're going, you have to have that destination. You have to see the other side. You have to know that it's there. If you're believing for healing and you're sick, you have to see that shoreline, that destination on the other side to get you there. The three words I want to focus on today are the other side. Destination is of the utmost importance. How do we know if we've arrived safely if we don't have a destination? The three words speak to us of focus. Where and what are you focusing on on a daily basis? There was a word given by God to the disciples. Get in the boat, go to the other side. Now, I, I would have asked why. Where are we going? Is it a rocky shoreline or is it sandy? Should we expect trouble? I mean, no, 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 no. Just do what I said. Get in the boat and go to the other side. Because what we look at and what you see controls your mind and therefore controls your life. Hi, Linda. It's my, it's my mom in the, in the Lord right there. So, uh, What you look at and what you see controls your mind and therefore controls your life. Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Now that word perish, that's kind of an odd word to put there. They don't just fall over and die. The word perish means cast off all restraint and run wild. Where there is no vision, I'll tell you what, there's vision coming out of this place. I don't know if you hear it or see it from the pulpit, but I see it and hear it in Tanner. He knows where he's going. He knows what he's doing. 
He knows he wants to get there. Man, and that's just a special place to be a part of. Where there is no vision, the people perish, cast off all restraint, and run wild. What we focus on grows. What we focus on gets bigger. What it consumes our life, it comes alive. So what are you focusing on? Because what happened when those disciples got in the boat? They got to the middle. Why is it that you get to the middle of stuff and then the winds come up and the waves come up? Why couldn't they have just right at the shore looked out and go, Ew, looks kind of windy and look at those waves out there. We, we better not get in the boat and go. No, Jesus has flat calm until they get to the middle. And all of a sudden, the winds and the waves start coming up. We put our, what we put our focus on grows, comes alive, consumes our time, becomes what we see most often, and ultimately controls our mind. And what controls our mind controls our future. What are you looking at? What is gaining your attention? Is it the word of God that he's spoken and you're trying to obey? Or is it the winds and the waves that are coming into your life? Because light will give you the opportunity to look away from the word and focus on the wind and the waves. Will you take that opportunity or will you continue to look and work on the word, stand on the word and believe that? Too many in the church have been focusing on the wrong things and because we struggle in our minds to see the shoreline in the distance, we often lose faith. You know, we all have struggles and trials that bring up winds and waves, right? You're th you want to be debt free. You, you want to pay for your home. You want to uh, have a good retirement and that's the shoreline over there. That's where your faith is at. But you're in the middle where you've got pandemic and mass mandates and unemployment and maybe you've lost your job or been downsized and now the winds and the waves start to come up and you can't really see that shoreline in the distance. What are you going to, what are you going to stand on? What are you going to believe in? The word of God that he said immediately, just get in the boat and go to the other side. That's all he said. He wants you to do your part and then he will do his part. We focus on the winds and the waves, the struggles, the hardships, the disappointments of life, and it pulls our focus away from the word of God and we can't see that shoreline in the distance. We should be focusing on things like, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Yeah. Lean not unto your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will. The winds and the waves are still coming but it's up to you to focus on the right things. Where you look determines what you see and what you see determines how you think. Now this isn't on a Sunday morning, right? Because winds and waves kind of tend to calm on Sunday morning. But you get up Monday morning to go to work and it just seems like those winds and the waves, they pick up again. And there you are left to decide what am I going to look at? Am I going to look at the word and what he says? Or am I going to look at the wind and the waves that are causing havoc in my life and put my focus on them? But you know that if you put your focus on that, that that's kind of the direction that you're going to be drawn. And that's going to get bigger. And all of a sudden, you're going to be fearful. You're going to be upset. Don't feel like you can take another step. Just can't feel like you can make it through the day. Can't... Don't feel like it, that God is ever going to hear you and ever going to bring things to pass in your life. For too long, we've allowed the culture to tell us what we see. But I see a shift where the word of God becomes more important than what we see on CNN or Fox News or what we see in the newspaper. Sure, you can watch it, you read it, but you have to look at it and go, I see it. I understand it, but that's not where I'm going to put my focus. My focus is going to be on what God says about my life. Immediately, they got in the boat and went to the other side. Let's go back again to the text. 
Immediately, he made his disciples get in the boat and go before him to the other side to Bethsaida while he sent the multitude away. And when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. So you think, you know, he's in some wooded area, you know, kind of high up on the mountain, stuck in a cave somewhere, and he's praying. That's kind of what I thought of when I read it the first time. But then... It says, now when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea and he was alone on the land and he saw them. So obviously he wasn't hiding in the cave somewhere praying. He was watching. What was he doing? I mean, the teacher had given an assignment. Get in the boat, go to the other side. Now, I'm going to step away and see how you do with that little situation. Right? Because if you don't know anything... He's not going to test you on anything. But the more you know, the more he's going to test you. Some of you look at your life and go, why in the world is this going on? Well, you obviously know something. And he's just testing you on whether or not you know it here or it's become a part of your life on a daily basis. They've just been a part of that great miracle, the loaves and the fishes. And now he gives them a new focus and a new goal. Get in the boat and go to the other side. They were given a word by God and their responsibility only was to obey and row the boat. That was their job. They weren't told, now make sure you make it uh, over there to where those lush gardens are and the sand is really nice and smooth as you come up. No, he just said, get in the boat, go to the other side. So they got in. And started to do exactly that. Obey the word. Just rowing. And the Bible says that the wind and the waves came up and they changed their focus. From what the word was to them to the winds and the waves. Because it wasn't up to them to get to the shore. The word was just get in the boat and go. And you know, in my mind... I was picturing a boat where I'm sitting down, rowing, looking for that shore, right? And then I was reading about the rowers. You know the rowers you see like in the Olympics, you know? And there's like 12 of them in the boat, you know? How are they positioned? Are they looking at the the finish line going, we're going to make it? We're going to make it. We're, I can see it. We're going to get there. No. They're backwards. Their only job is to put that oar in the water as best as they can and get to the other shore. When you're believing his word, that's what you're doing. Your back's to the shore and you're just doing what you've been told to do. And you're trusting him to get you to the other side. Just get in. Go to the other side. Sometimes it's just hard to see that. The circumstances and situations in life cause the wind and the waves to blow. But let me tell you, God is never without purpose in your season of struggle. He's not just throwing you into that mess to go, eh, I hope they do all right. Hope they make it. He always has a purpose there. Now, if I was going to be here next Sunday, I'm not, right, Tanner? (laughs) I would talk to you about what happened when they got to the other side. Blind eyes were open. People were healed. God's purpose was done in an amazing way. They had an assignment. They had a place to get to. You have an assignment, Word of Life Christian Center, to get there. 
We're never out of his loving, caring gaze. Getting to the other side requires that we omit things that will not get us there. Fear won't get us there. Doubt won't get us there. Worrying won't get us there. Complaining won't get us there. Leaning to our own understanding won't get us there. What will get us there is believing the word of God. It's funny, the other things that I had in my mind before I talked about or read about and studied about the boat was I saw all of us in our own boat, kind of like a, uh, uh, what's it called, a redneck yacht club, kind of all, you know, all tied up together, right? You can kind of all, but God started to talk to me about all of us being in the same boat. If you're a part of World Life Christian Center, you're in the same boat. You, too, in the same boat with you, too. When you struggle, they struggle. When you're blessed, they're blessed. When you cry, they cry. That's what it's like being in the boat. This boat that Jesus built, this is an unsinkable boat. The boat of faith and salvation and Christianity does not sink. The only way you sink is if you jump off the side. And why would you? Why would you give up on what's important in the boat? Those people that are with you speaks to me of community and relationship. I mean, I talked to Robert this morning. I talked to Derwin this morning who's doing security this morning. And they all feel like they're a part of this body, this congregation. Like we're all in the same boat together. You all have a responsibility. What does it look like? Rowing the boat is hard. It's hard work. Now, you know, on the Olympics, you never see like, you know, these, what are they called? The big long, it's like a skull or, yeah, I don't know either. And and you see them and they're, and the water is just glass, you know? And one stroke of the, the oar, and it's like, whew, 30 feet, and we go. Whew, 30 feet, and we go. So it's okay with everybody in the boat and maybe just a few people rowing. But when those winds and waves come up, you need all hands on deck. And if you're going to be a part of this church, you're in the boat with them. You need to grab an oar and get to work. All you're doing is believing the word of God, not looking around at your surroundings to see the wind and the waves. The wind, the Bible says, was contrary. I I just love what the Bible says. The wind was contrary to them. It was opposite in nature. Isn't that just how life is? Like, you get going, and you're out there in your boat, and all of a sudden the winds don't seem to pick up and propel you forward. They're challenging you. When you go to the gym, oh, sorry. When you go to the gym, and you're really, you pick up a dumbbell, what is there? There's opposition. That dumbbell is contrary to your muscle. But in order to grow stronger, better. You've got to use that opposition, that contrariness to grow stronger. That's what he expects. As that wind blows toward your boat, you got your head down and you got your oar in the water and you're just going. That's what he expects. And that's what it's like to be in the boat with everybody else. Hmm. Do your boat, do your part, row the boat and God will do his part and propel your boat to the other side. Faith isn't faith until something's required of it. Now, if you're new to Christianity, maybe you've given your life to the Lord in the last couple weeks, or you're new to the church here and receiving the word, and it's just hunky-dory to you, I can't tell you that everything is going to be perfect. Now, my life will tell you that it will not be. Okay? When you get saved, you become a Christian... (laughs) <laughs> I 
I hate to say it that way. When you become a Christian, it's not like it's all a bed of roses, right? There's issues, there's difficulties that come up, and you need to be focused on what this word says rather than the winds and the waves that come up. Know this, in your life, the wind and the waves can't, if they can't bring destruction, they will always bring distraction. Well, I don't think I need to go to church every Sunday. I mean, you know, it's, it's every Sunday. So if I miss one, it's like I can just come the next Sunday and, you know. But not when you're in the boat. Someone may need you. Someone may need that hug that you give, that, that word of encouragement to say, man, I missed you last week. How's it going? We prayed for you like two weeks ago. What's up, man? I just keep the faith. Keep believing. That's the type of church I want to go to. And if the church is like that, I want to be there every week. And if you don't find somebody like that, be that person. Every time you come in the door looking for someone. Boy, it's just so good to see you. I know God's doing something great in my life. Well, you know, my family is, is really struggling. Let's pray. Let's just... Believe the word. Believe what God says about your situation. Let's pray together. Man. Because that's what happens in the ship. You know, a new member comes in the boat in the ship. It's like, hey, I'm John. You know, this is Tanner. This is Amy. This is Rachel. This is Linda. We're in the boat together. Oh, well, I'm, I'm struggling. You know, uh, oh, you are? Let's help you. We can do that. You know, yeah, you need some groceries? Yeah, we can do that for you. Really? Yeah, you're a part of the boat. You're in it. Now here, grab an oar, start rowing. Because we're not staying here. You know, the oar is meant to propel, to go, to move. And that's what we're doing. We're moving to the other side. Rowing is hard. Rowing is work. What does rowing look like? Rowing looks like prayer. Rowing looks like giving. Well, you know, I'm giving my money to the church. You know, I, I worked for it. And uh, I've got bills to pay. What are you looking at? Are you looking at the winds and the waves? Or do you see a shoreline in the distance where you're debt-free, where your church is debt-free, where your pastor is well-paid, where if someone comes into the congregation, doesn't have anything, you can say, hey, come with me. Let's, this afternoon, let's go to Target. I got, I got 500 bucks. Let's just buy you six or seven new outfits. You know, you're newly saved and, and you need an apartment. Wonderful. I know a place. I'll put the down payment down for you. That's what the church is, is like. That's what being in the same boat is. You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm. Often in the church, too many people on the boat. Oh, shoot. Should I say that or not? I am the guest, right? <laughs> and I don't have to come back. Um, often in the church, too many people on the boat aren't using the oar that they've been given. And that, like I said, that's fine when everything's, you know, the, gla- the water's like glass. And one little row and your boat just... But when things get crazy, you need all hands on deck. Everybody with an oar has to be on their side of the boat getting stuff done. Can you imagine what it must have felt like to row ferociously and it looks like you're making no progress? I mean, that must have been them. just going and going in that boat and you can't tell if you're any closer to the shoreline or not what do you do just keep rowing well it's hard out here welcome to the club (laughs) grab your oar get to work the victory hear me 
isn't in the advancement. That's not your role. The victory is in the rowing. The fact that you can go through what you're going through, still believe the word of God, believe what he says, and go through the situations that you're going through, that's the victory. You know, in our church, in our American ch church, there has to be advancement, it feels like, be before we feel like we're successful. Well, there was 100 people coming to our church last year at this time, and now there's 127. We must be successful. No, you're successful because you get in here every day, stand right here, and preach the Word of God. That's Tanner Payton's role. His role is not to build the church. His role is to be faithful, do what God asks of him, and then depend on God for the rest of it. He doesn't say, I'm taking up an offering, and John, you made $1,000 this week, so obviously you're going to bring $100. No. He says, it benefits you to give to the church, to be a part of what's going on, and then he trusts God with the rest of it. Hmm. Rowers have a picture in their minds. Now they have to because they're facing the wrong way. So they have to have a picture in their mind of what that shoreline looks like. What's in your mind? What are you concentrating on? What takes your focus? Is it the word of God? Or is it the winds and the waves that come through life? Choice is yours. What's created a picture inside of your mind today? A news bite full of fear and worry, concern, distraction, or the word of God? The choice is yours. For too long, we've allowed the picture of our future to be created by the words that are coming out of the culture. Too many of us are paralyzed with fear and never get our oar in the water. We sit here, but really we're of no benefit to the boat because our oar is dry. Get in the boat, grab an oar, and begin to row the boat. Don't worry about what happens to you in the middle. What happens to you in the middle isn't yours to worry about. That's his to worry about. No wave. No wave. And you know, some of us had bigger waves than others. Right, Rachel? Linda? Some of our waves are pretty big. But no wave is bigger than the Word of God that's on the inside of you. If you put it into practice, Cam and I tell our third through fifth graders, this is the Bible. You have to read it. And then got to put it into practice. Otherwise, it does you no benefit. I hand you this oar. You take that kayak out, set it in the water. You sit in that kayak, nice come to get your feet right. Hold that thing like this and it never gets wet. You'll never go anywhere. The problem with that is you're not the only one in the boat. Everybody else is going with you to the other side. And if they're struggling, struggling and rowing, you have to come alongside and say, man, let me get my oar in the water. Let's do this together. Rowing isn't what produces the progress. Rowing is the progress. That 
that you can continue to row in spite of the circumstances, that's the progress. Don't worry about where your boat is in conjunction with the other shoreline. Just row the boat. You'll get there. Well, I've been believing for this healing for two years. That's all right. You're in the middle. Somewhere in the middle. You're not at the shoreline yet. Keep believing. Well, still in debt a little bit. Keep believing. Keep sowing. Keep doing what God's word says to do. And eventually, you will get there. You have an assignment on that other shoulder. They did amazing things when they got there. But they couldn't have got there if they weren't putting that oil in the water and rowing that water the whole time. Because you know, you give up an oar and all of a sudden you were making progress now you're going backwards. Faith Faith doesn't produce the victory. Faith is the victory. doesn't produce the victory. Faith is the victory. Continue to believe on a daily basis. Well, my wife, you know, she's been sick for six years. And, you know, keep believing. We don't see anything. Throw the boat. Keep believing. Keep standing on his word. Eventually you will get to the other side. None of us get there without everybody else. It's not a race. If you're in the Word of Life boat, if you're in the Word of Life boat, if you're in the Word of Life boat, you've made a commitment. And because you've made a commitment, God has blessed this place made it a haven for people to come who aren't in the boat but they're desperate to get into that boat the centurion in Luke chapter 7 I always certain stories in the Bible where you just you know there's something else there but you just don't Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. 
Are you born again? Have you accepted Jesus as your Savior? If you have, wait, you have overcome the world. Come on, I'm just a 22-year-old guy, just a 45-year-old woman. What do you mean I've overcome the world? For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. This is the victory that when you overcome the world with this, even your faith. That's what it says. It doesn't say because you believed and you put your faith out there and this happened and you progressed and this blossomed. And because of that, you win. No. The fact that you have faith to believe one already. Stop waiting to see the results to confirm what you believe. The fact is, victory isn't in the victory. The victory is in the faith. Well, my son is away from God. He does drugs. Been that way for six years. Made a commitment to Jesus. 